Hi students, so you know that with the next exam being announced, there is a lot of thrust on integrative medicine and medicine where clinical and paraclinical subjects would be asked in a single question. So just to make your uh, job a bit easier, we are starting with this series where we are going to have discussions where two or three faculty members are going to get together and they'll discuss a particular case with you. Now, in this first session, we want to discuss a case, a patient with a neck swelling. And my aim is not to reveal the diagnosis to you up front. Okay? I want you to understand how do we work up a patient with a neck swelling? How do we then clinch the diagnosis, do the management? And Dr. Ella will also then talk about the pathological aspects of this condition. Okay? So, without much ado, let's move on to the uh, case. We have a 42-year-old lady who has come to the OPD with the swelling in the midline of the neck since the last four months. The swelling has been gradually increasing in size and she says that it moves up and down when she swallows. Okay. So what points in the history would you like to know? So before we move uh, any further, you can probably make out from the question stem that we are probably talking about a thyroid swelling. Now, for those who are in final year, this is very useful for you. What are the points which you will take in history when you present this case? So, you will ask for features of hyper and hypothyroidism. You will ask for compressive symptoms, whether that is hoarseness of voice, difficulty in breathing, difficulty in eating. Those are the things which you are going to find out. Similar swelling in the past, any treatment which has been taken or intervention for this and the other things to complete your history, your family history, the medical history and the personal history. Now, after taking all this, we've got to know that the swelling has been gradually increasing in size and there are no compressive features and no features suggestive of hypo or hyperthyroidism. After this, we move on to the examination of a thyroid swelling, which you know was asked in the AIMS exam as well, where they had asked about the examination of a thyroid gland. So the important points, of course, the list is quite long but I'm just talking about the important points you have to see for movement during deglutition the extent nodularity single lobe versus both lobe enlargement the lower limit and whether the lymph nodes are there or not you know the three methods and I just want to highlight them quickly for you you have the pizzolose method in the pizzolose method you know that the patient keeps his or her hand behind the head and then you examine the thyroid swelling the other method is the Lahis method. The Lahis method is when you want to feel the borders and the sides of the swelling. So the, the examiner is going to stand in front and he's going to push the thyroid gland from one side to the other side to look for the borders of the swelling. And the Kryls method is when with the thumb the examiner looks for nodularity. So these are just methods which you should be aware of. Now after doing all this, we've got to know that there, the swelling is in the right lobe of the thyroid, but the left lobe is also palpable. Right. So you know that if there is one swelling and the other lobe is also palpable, it is no longer a solitary thyroid nodule. Okay. Now the lower limit can be reached, which means it's not a retrosternal goiter and there's no palpable lymphadenopathy. Now, whenever we get a thyroid patient, the next step in the management, when we, you know, consult the pathologist before that, we do always do a thyroid function test. And after doing a thyroid function test, once we know that the patient is euthyroid, right, then after that we are going to proceed with an ultrasound after that. And the ultrasound in this case reveals a 3 into 4 centimeter hypoechoic lesion, which is taller than wider. This is of importance, taller than wider. And there is increased vascularity in the gland as well. No enlarged lymph nodes. You know when the lesion is taller than wider, it is suggestive of a malignancy and also increased vascularity is a sign which is seen in malignant lesions of thyroid. Also the lesion is going to be hypoechoic. So these are the features which are suggestive of a malignant lesion on ultrasound. Now once we've done this, we send the, we send the patient over to the pathologist who is going to carry out the next investigation. So the next investigation which we do is fine needle aspiration cytology. What is fine needle aspiration cytology? We, asp we, uh, we put a needle inside the thyroid gland, take the aspirate out, stain it with a stain and then look under the microscope for the features, right? So uh, what is a needle which we use for FNAC? 
the needle which we use is 23 to 30 gauge needle, correct? So what happens students? FNAC is the investigation of choice for all the thyroid lesions except for one thyroid lesion which is very commonly asked in the exams that is follicular carcinoma of thyroid. Now why you can't use FNAC for follicular carcinoma of thyroid? There is a reason behind that because it has a benign counterpart which is called as follicular adenoma. Now what do you do to differentiate a follicular adenoma from a follicular carcinoma, a pathologist has to look for capsular and or vascular invasion. Now students, please see that when we are aspirating, when we are doing FNAC, we are neither taking the capsule out nor we are taking the thyroid blood vessels out. So you cannot see either capsular or vascular invasion. So on FNAC, you won't be able to differentiate between a follicular adenoma and a follicular carcinoma. Therefore, FNAC cannot be used as an investigation. In this case, we will do the FNAC of this patient, right? There is another latest technique which has come up which is called as FNNAC. What is FNNAC? It is fine needle non-aspiration cytology. It is done for superficial lesions of breast and thyroid. Correct? After doing the FNAC, we will... So after the FNAC, after the pathologist has reported the slide, they also assign a number to it. And this is known as the Bethesda classification for reporting the thyroid FNAC specimens. Now, the Bethesda classification reports it in Thai 1 to Thai 5, where Thai 1 is non-diagnostic. And imagine that I sent the patient over to Dr. Ila and she did, a, she did an FNAC, but it was inconclusive. So in that case, they're going to write it as Thai 1. So if it turns out to be inconclusive, what would be my next step? Well, my next step here would be that I'll get an ultrasound guided FNAC done so that we hit the right area and the chances of false negative go away. Okay. Similarly, thai one c is non-diagnostic cystic, same, we'll do an ultrasound guided FNAC there as well. thai 2 is non-neoplastic, if it is non-neoplastic, we just follow up the patient, we don't have to do anything else. thai 3 is follicular, which Dr. Illa has already explained to you, that we cannot differentiate an adenoma versus a carcinoma, so there we are going to do a hemithyroidectomy. Thai 4 is suspicious of malignancy and Thai 5 is malignancy where we'll do surgery. Now in this patient, Dr. Illa reported it to be a Thai 5 lesion where they were very certain that it was a malignancy and they were erring towards the side of a papillary carcinoma of thyroid, right? So now the patient has collected the report and the patient has come back to me with the report of papillary thyroid cancer. So now the question is how do we manage the patient? Now if you... If we go back to the presentation, it was a swelling which was approximately 3 to 4 centimeters in size. Okay, So moving on to our management, so we have a 3 to 4 centimeter papillary thyroid cancer and we know that there are no lymph nodes here, right? There are no lymph nodes. So because the lesion is more than 2 centimeters in size, we are completely ruling out a hemithyroidectomy option here. So the treatment here is going to be a total thyroidectomy. That is what we need to do if it's a papillary thyroid cancer which is more than 2 centimeters in size all patients are going to get a total thyroidectomy in this case. Now we know that the lymph nodes are not enlarged. Okay, Lymph nodes were not enlarged. So is there a role of prophylactic lymph node dissection? Well level 6 lymph node clearance and this I am talking about prophylactic level 6 clearance is done in T3 and T4 lesions. So is this a T3, T4 lesion? No, this is a T2 lesion. T2 is 2 to 4 centimeters. So this is a T2 lesion, not a T3, T4 lesion. So my only surgery in this case will be a total thyroidectomy, which I'm going to carry out. Now, once I've done a total thyroidectomy, the specimen again goes to the pathologist. And now the pathologist will tell us the findings of this case. So when we get the specimen, when I do the glossing of the specimen, I see that we can't see, we couldn't see any thyroid nodules. What I see were certain papillary projections. When we did the microscopic examination, we all know that how does a normal thyroid gland looks like? A normal thyroid gland will have thyroid follicles 
and these thyroid follicles will, will be filled with a pinkish material called as colloid. In this case, on the other hand, what we see are these papillary projections which we see. Now, in the exam or in the pathology lab, how do we identify a true papilla? The characteristic feature of a true papilla is a fibrovascular core, which in this image you can beautifully see. Can we see in these finger-like projections, these blood vessels which are there? In the, these are called as a fibrovascular cores and these are a sign that this is a true papilla, right? So, this is what we saw. We saw these papillae. When we saw the high power view, on the high power view, I saw that the papillae are not lined by normal thyroid follicular cells. Instead, they were lined by these cells which have got a clear nuclei. The cells did not have anything inside. That is why these are called as orphan anii nuclei or these are optically clear nuclei. You can't see anything inside. Right? These orphan anii nuclei are a characteristic feature of papillary carcinoma of thyroid. Remember that, right? Why do we call them orphan anii? Because orphan anii was a cartoon character students and the, what the cartoonist did what, was he forgot to uh, make any pupil inside the eye of this uh, cartoon character. So as you can see in this image, the eye is totally clear. So the nuclei of this patient of papillary carcinoma of thyroid has been compared to this little orphan ani. Remember, we pathologists are very fond of imagination. So, this is a vague imagination of a pathologist. So, this is one thing, one nuclear feature which we see that is the orphan ani eye nuclei. Two other nuclear features which are very important in a case of papillary carcinoma of thyroid is in this image, can you appreciate these nuclei which have a groove in the middle? These nuclei are something like this, they have a groove, so it looks like a coffee bean. That is why these nuclei are called as coffee bean nuclei, right? They are also uh, compared to a coffee bean, that is why they are called as coffee bean nuclei. Another thing which we see in this slide is this arrow which shows nuclear pseudo inclusions. They are not true inclusions, they are pseudo inclusions inside the nucleus. So, four things to look for in a papillary carcinoma slide are papillae, which are lined by fibrovascular cores, orphan anii nuclei, nuclear pseudo inclusions, and coffee beaning. Another important point is the presence of SAMOMA bodies. The pathologist also looks for something which is called as SAMOMA bodies. They are also a characteristic feature of a case of papillary carcinoma of thyroid. So, five histopathological features. Remember students, nuclear features are a hallmark of papillary carcinoma of thyroid. That is why there is a variant of papillary carcinoma which is called as a follicular variant of papillary carcinoma. In that what happens, although the cells are arranged in follicles, but the nuclear features are those of papillary cancer. That is why we make a diagnosis of follicular variant of papillary cancer and not follicular carcinoma of thyroid, correct? So when we saw the slide of this patient, we reported it as papillary carcinoma of thyroid and sent the report to Dr. Rohan. The follicular variant of papillary cancer, which uh, Dr. Ella was mentioning, is also known as Lindsay tumor. So, once we have the report, that's not the end of the treatment for this patient. We need to do, we need to follow up this patient as well. So, you know that once we've done the surgery, now we have to do a whole body iodine scan to look for residual disease or for metastasis. But before we do this whole body iodine scan, we need to make sure that the patient is ready for that scan or the TSH is more than 20. Why do we want the TSH to be more than 20? Because if there's any thyroid tissue left anywhere in the body, it should be hungry for iodine, right? It should be starving for iodine so that when we give it, it actively takes it up. But what happens is when you make the patient wait for four to six weeks for the TSH to rise, they can suffer from hypothyroid symptoms. So a, a latest thing which you can do is that you can give a recombinant TSH injection and that can boost up the TSH within two days and you'll be ready to do your scan. Now, once we've done this scan, if there is residual disease present, then we treat it with radioiodine ablation, which acts via beta rays and the half-life is seven to eight days. We also give a single dose of radioiodine ablation if, the, if lymph nodes are positive 
or if there is a persistently high thyroglobin which is continuing. If there is no metastasis or residual disease, then the patient goes under lifelong follow-up with six monthly ultrasounds and serum thyroglobin. Serum thyroglobin is the tumor marker for differentiated thyroid cancers. And if this goes above two nanograms per milliliter, then we should suspect a recurrence in these patients. Now, another thing which I want to tell you here where the role of a pathologist comes in. So I've told you serum thyroglobin is a tumor marker for differentiated thyroid cancers. But you know which is that condition in which you have antibodies against thyroglobin. Right, you know that they are there in Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And Hashimoto's thyroiditis is one of the leading causes of hypothyroidism. So before I start following up a patient with serum thyroglobin as the tumor marker, I am going to rule out those anti-thyroglobin antibodies and then only I'll start using this test effectively. In the end, we also need to prognosticate this patient. You know that papillary thyroid cancer has the best prognosis. Right. And as I always jokingly tell you, there is a line written in Devita that for all other cancers, the oncologist attends the patient's funeral. But for papillary thyroid cancer, it is the other way around. The patient attends the oncologist's funeral. Basically, they're trying to say that it has a very good prognosis. Now, there are three prognostic factors or scores which you should know. Ages, AMIs and masses, which includes age, grade, extracapsular spread and size. And the masses score is also a post-operative score because one of the inclusions here is completeness of resection, which we'll get to know after surgery, right? So this was a patient with the neck swelling where we've told you how to work up the case and how to proceed with the diagnosis and the management of the patient as well. Hope you liked this video. These were our regular dining table conversations when we both were doing our post-graduation and we are happy to bring one of those dining table conversations to you in this manner. If you like it, we'll record more such videos on other topics where surgery and pathology can be combined together. Please do let us know which other topics do you want them to be recorded. Thank you so much and all the best. Thank you.